her power lie. And so with that, you know, you got in the darker blue side, you'll see external locus of control. So outcomes outside of your control, you know, supposedly determined by fate and independent of your hard work and decision. So like also understanding like a lot of people who are even attracted to this conversation, you're trying, you're doing a lot of great work in whatever systems you're in right now to reconsider the standard way of doing things. And yet sometimes the folks who try to like shift, they can get, um, there's a lot of flack put on them, you know? Um, and so just knowing like there, there is a force that we are moving through, which is called grind culture. And I'll talk about that just a tad bit in a moment. But, um, and so that is like an external thing. And yet, even though there's this big system of grind culture that kind of has us, has us to like dehumanize ourselves in the name of productivity and work, we do have power, we can access it, and it helps to name what the power is. And that's what the light blue side is, our internal locus of control. So what are the outcomes that we have within us that are within our control? And so we're gonna try to see if we can work through that, okay? And so with that, a really quick spiel on grind culture. I'm not sure if y'all read the book. Hopefully you, get, you got a copy of it. Um, I'm not sure how that worked out exactly, but it's also on Amazon and you know you can find it. So grind culture is a system fueled by addictive achievement caused by a capitalist economy and it measures a person's overall worth and value based upon how much they can produce. All right, and so some a quick synopsis of what that could look like in on an individual level, a fear of stillness, feeling guilty about resting, viewing exhaustion as productive sacrificing the needs of your body to produce and overpacking your calendar okay so that's just kind of how it can look like on a day-to-day -day. and um, some other symptoms include never feeling satisfied with what you have feeling guilty about resting thinking something's wrong with you if you're not being productive or not being productive enough and then being in competition um, with others over who's the most productive right and so I wanted to just share, well, what are, the, what are the, the things that can fuel grind culture? White supremacy, capitalism, ableism, internalized oppression, perfectionism, gender oppression. And I just know that we all have a story. We all have a story around how, you know, we have been impacted by these isms, at least one of these isms, okay? Um, I am going to share a, a quick story of um, a professional experience that I had um, just around um, kind of how I realized that, uh, how I even started to like think about the topic of like decolonizing the workplace. So I was actually working in an organization. Um, I was uh, I was in a director role or senior, I guess like it was like a senior executive. I don't know, I had like a lot, I had like one of those titles that had like a lot of, you know, those long titles. I had one of those, but it was like, I was on the executive leadership team and stuff. And um, ran by uh, people of color, okay? So it was ran by uh, folks who had been really grounded in, in community work did a lot of great stuff in the community, did a lot to push the envelope around what social justice could be, what wellness could be, you know, folks who were trying, okay? Um, that being said, there were some, you know, as I, you know, really stepped into this role, I started to see that there were some like power dynamics that were really difficult to name. And I was, um, you know, I fought really hard to get a retreat, a wellness retreat into the um, into the organization, because I just could tell, first of all, this was like uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic and people were really tired and really exhausted. And if you can remember how you were like right at the beginning of the pandemic, we all kind of like threw our, not all, but a lot of us threw ourselves into like work and we're like, whoa, 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 we're like, there's like no boundaries. What happened to our boundaries, you know? And so we were kind of in that state. And so um, we, we finally got an opportunity to like take a couple days, do a staff retreat, and just to really have some moments of self-reflection. And um, we had never, you know, the organization had never 
at least while I had been there, I'm not going to say never, but during my time there for five years, I had never seen um, like a, like an organizational evaluation or anything where you could evaluate your director, your superior. Okay. There was never something like that. And I was like, okay, I want this. I want to do this. I want to go in and like, let's just try to create a safe space or a safe environment around um, getting some authentic feedback and evaluation. So that was like me being like, yeah, let's just, you know, change things and um, did a lot. You know, we had a good retreat. Um, and I had some very interesting conversations with the staff around how they felt like things could change. You know, they had a lot of opinions and they didn't, there was some issues around feeling valued. So I was like, okay, well, let me try to capture some data. Let's do an, uh, let's do a survey. Nobody's name needs to be on it. Uh, let's just kind of see what the general attitudes are of the organization. Uh, did it, nobody. Uh, they they filled out the survey when it came down to like getting any kind of feedback around leadership everybody left the question blank everybody left it blank nobody answered it and i was like what this is our chance like come on like i'm trying to like get gather data so we can start making systemic change but nobody wanted to to answer and so I, I realized there was a glaring issue um, around that there was something there was some kind of anxiety around feedback and evaluation or just giving feedback at all like feedback was seen as a negative thing um, and so that kind of led me down a pretty interesting journey around like well what could um, why is that like why why was feedback not safe you know um, and so you know, and another time I'll share more about what that experience was like. Um, but I also really understand when we, when we think about um, our society where a lot of times we're being rated. Um, so we have a lot of things where it's like we need to get a five star review. I don't know if anybody has like an Airbnb account or something like that, like just the five stars getting that, you know, the top reviews, like something about our, you know, if we think about all the likes and the shares there's something about that, like that that intrinsically motivates us or we're being trained that that int intrinsically motivates us and sometimes I, I can I feel like that prevents us from you know, going deeper or to like having authentic conversations and so um, I am now trying to open up the chat let's see and I saw that there were two comments so I actually want to pause and see if I can see that so I'm not seeing it on whatever reason. Um, Ash, would you be able to sh to just kind of um, see what you're seeing? Are, do you see anything in the chat? Yeah. Okay. I posted the sign up link for the book. So if folks okay. have already filled that out and then there was a comment from Susan around not being able to stay on. Okay, got it. All right. So um, I um, so I just wanted to that was like my first um, inclination around like, okay, what could decolonizing the workplace look like? And I, I understand that it's messy, but there's a reason why I'm really um, annoying about it. And a big piece is because of grind culture and how we got to the point of where we're at in the work, the American workplace in particular. I speak a lot from being, uh, you know, a, a a black American woman and what that's looked like for me in the workplace. Um, but I'm not going to go into big detail about it because I've done it in other workshops, but um, and it's in this book. So hopefully people can can get to that. But um, a lot of the pra the corporate practices that we're currently engaged in are engaging in are rooted in chattel slavery. Just period in the story. So we can keep replicating it, but it's going to cause a this is going to Continue to cause us like a lot more harm and trying to find other ways of existing outside of the framework of grind culture might also be harmful too because we're not going to always we're not going to necessarily know the perfect thing to do we might need to fall on our face a couple times um but it's necessary uh, i i find it necessary just to like for my own humanity you know to see and also for anybody that i manage anybody that I, I work closely with, like, how can I make sure that I honor their humanity too? Um, so that's kind of the why behind it. And 
there's a couple of, of resources around um, and, uh, the, you know, how uh, very much per perpetuated by a system of chattel slavery that you can look into, okay? And then the other thing I wanna say before we get a little deeper into this conversation is I am because we are. So this is that concept of Ubuntu, uh, which is based on a South African concept of I am because we are. And so I have this picture of this wheelchair ramp. I shared this picture in another workshop. I think it's important to share it again, um, just because this little wheelchair ramp means so much so if you see this ramp is helping people um, get up the stairs who maybe wouldn't be able to take those two steps for a variety of reasons. So this is designed for people who use wheelchairs and yet um, a lot of other people benefit from this wheelchair ramp. Strollers, people with strollers benefit from the ramp. People who have carts benefit from the ramp. And this is, an, um, this is basically a concept called targeted universalism. When we find ways to um, make modifications to our systems for uh, one oppressed group, it actually opens way more doors for other oppressed groups as well. So I just want you to keep that in mind too. And also know this conversation around decolonizing the workplace is not, um, it's not just about race. I just mentioned I, I had an experience at an organization and uh, the, the, high, the people in the highest positions of power were people of color, okay? So it's deeper than that. This is a consciousness thing, all right? So I just, you know, keeping those in mind, um, I am going to uh, share four ways to decolonize the workplace, but before I do that, I know that there is collective wisdom on this call now. I honor wherever folks are at in this moment. So there might be folks who are comfortable verbally sharing. If so, I very much welcome that. Uh, sharing in the chat, welcome that too. Um, processing internally, maybe writing in your notebook or typing some notes out. I honor that too, just understanding that um, I don't really know the stories of folks who are on this call. I don't know what it took for you to even get on this call, what, you know, what kind of struggles you are navigating currently even to stay on this call. Um, but I do want to uh, try to have like more deeper conversations. I was kind of hesitant to have deeper conversations until I laid the framework for grind culture in some of the other meetings that I, I had with with folks at University of Denver, but I, I would love to have deeper conversations around um, uh, decolonizing the workplace. Um, and I think it's good to have it in a smaller group. Like I see we have about 14 people on the call. So with that, I kind of want to pause. I'm just going to stop my share for a moment um, and just, uh, I have a question just around what are some ways based upon like the collective wisdom on this call what does decolonizing the workplace look like for you? I'm gonna type that into the chat now. And I'm also gonna acknowledge the three comments that just came in as people kind of think about this. So give me a moment. Okay, so Susan, send in love to Susan, who wasn't able to stay on in my work, but I do want to acknowledge her full comment. In my work, grind culture comes up all the time. So excited to read the book. Thank you for this work. Deeply grateful. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Um, thank you, Stacy. Stacy is offering a note of gratitude. Yay, we need gratitude. Grateful for times of reflecting and relaxing, especially the upcoming holidays for rest time. I'm, I'm um, working on my rest. I Heather, would love I, to just be able to, oh. I wanted to let you know your Wi-Fi, like your audio and your video are lagging quite a bit. There's, um, I'm wondering oh, if maybe things are, oh, okay. you're breaking up. Let me up. check my Wi-Fi. 
Oh, okay. Hmm. It did just, I did just get a note that my Wi-Fi is unstable. So let me try this. I'm going to try to connect with my iPhone and I'm going to see if And if folks, I know um, while Heather is reconnecting with the Wi-Fi issues, um, if you want to add answers to the chat, even if that um, we need to resend them back to Heather when she's back on, that's totally fine. But the question, just to read it out for folks again, is what does decolonizing the workplace look like for you? Um, so that's what just came up in the chat. Can y'all hear me? me <laughs> i can, can hear you, you. i know we can okay. hear and see you. it's definitely breaking up and yeah okay um i'm going to stop my video for a second it does is there any difference with the quality of my voice with my video off it does feel like it's breaking up less with your video off mm -hmm. hmm. okay I don't know what that's about. I'm so sorry about that. Um, I guess I have to take my own advice and go camera off. Hopefully um, you can still resonate. Um, and we're gonna have a conversation. I'm just gonna finish reading these comments. So I, you know, affirm Stacy being grateful for times of reflection. Kiko, I saw Kiko had a comment. I work with mothers and I can see this capitalistic grind culture messes mom's mental wellness and identity. Thank you for uplifting that. Um, it's not a conversation we have around, uh, we have a lot. And I think a lot of times it's because it's kind of a risky conversation to have, you know, um, we just don't have as many um, opportunities to, to really kind of talk about some of the struggles. So thank you for bringing that. Okay, that is all right. And so two more messages. I see that Karen says having time to think about what is decolonizing the workplace look like times to think and breathe. Okay. Accepting on outfits, hair, etc. Awesome. Believing that we are all working our hardest slash best that we can and assuming positive intent. Okay. And then yes to accepting natural hair. Awesome. So it looks like um, it's around time. I'm seeing there's a theme around time. Uh, appearance, being accepted for the appearance. And then also um, kindness, you know, also like uh, having an open mind. All right. And then I also see another comment, which sounds really good. Uh, this one is from... Let's see. All right, Stacy, being allowed to wear what is comfortable to the individual in the world, being able to take care of care needs without recourse when the society system is not set up to support parents, especially mothers. Oh, we got the mothers again. Mothers are coming through, you know? I would like to say the same with anybody with care responsibilities. Yes, um, care work. People who work a shift when they get home from their professional job, the one that pays the bills, the people who have a shift of taking care of beings, <laughs> you know, um, and a lot of we know that so that's a conversation to be had. Thank you for uplifting that. All right. So the next one, it looks like Stephanie says. Let's see, something about boundaries around responding to Slack. Oh my gosh, let's not even get into Slack right now. <laughs> Slack slash emails during non-work hours. Boundaries, okay? Decolonizing the workplace looks like having boundaries and having those boundaries, not just having the boundaries, because you can say what your boundary is, but will it be listened to, respected, heard, etc.? Are you allowed to have boundaries if you are employed somewhere? Like these are questions that we are unpacking. Hope says, I'm not any smarter when wearing a suit than I am. Okay, it says my internet connection is unstable. 
I am going to take off. I'm, I don't know. I almost like I'm going to take off my microphone real quick and I just want to see if me is causing it. So I'm going to take it off. And if you could just let me know if you hear me any differently without the mic, if you could just let me know. Okay. I'm talking without a microphone. Is that better at all? It sounds the same. Your audio is actually great since you've turned off your video. It's not um, as broken up. So, okay, cool. All right. Um, if that's different for anyone else, please put that in the chat, but I'm, I'm having a much better time hearing you with your video off. Okay, cool. I am not any smarter when wearing a suit than I am with messy hair and sweatpants, says Hope. I'll shade of that. Okay, Stephanie says, yes, on comfortable wear. My team regularly wears athleisure in the office. I love me some athleisure. Love it. Um, Shinhei Ferguson says, dismantling some of the characteristics of white supremacy culture, perfectionism, sense of urgency, et cetera. And then also like perfectionism comes from perfect. Well, what's considered perfect in our society, right? And we can kind of fill in the blank with that one. Um, Karen, recognizing and valuing all varied gifts that people bring to the workplace. All right. Kiko says no change. I'm a little, I don't, oh, okay. You're talking about my, <laughs> my audio. Okay. Um, Michelle says I'm with you. Hope sneakers actually help me think better. Yes. Awesome. Okay. So a lot around appearance, a lot around, um, yeah, a lot of appearance. And so the next thing that I would like to do is I'm going to make some offerings. So I actually created a PDF for folks just to kind of um, something to take home and to, to marinate on. This is an hour workshop and we can I can only scratch the surface with you. So I really wanted to um, ensure that I left you with something um, outside of the book that um, specifically related to this topic where you're kind of able to um, have some actionable steps around what's in your locus of control to decolonize the workplace. So I am going to ask a follow-up question. Thank you all so much for your responses. I actually just put the PDF in the chat, a link to the PDF in the chat. Let me know if you have issues with um, accessing it. But if there are like four actionable steps that you might be able to take to decolonize the workplace. And so my next question is, what is in your locus of control in the workplace? And so I'm not asking you what you do. I'm not asking you what your position is or what your role is, because uh, we do that too much in our society anyway. Let's go beyond that what is in your locus of control okay so don't feel like you have to respond right away you might need to marinate it or you might already specifically know what's in your locus of control um, but at this point i'm going to actually be writing pdf um, so they say they attribute the the quote the definition of insanity is doing the same thing repeatedly and expecting different results I've heard that it's from Albert Einstein, but apparently it's actually an unknown person who said it. So I can't attribute it to him, but let's just think about that. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing repeatedly and expecting different results. So grind culture is a hamster wheel. If we keep on the hamster wheel of grind culture, we can move, we can move fast, but we're not gonna get far. We're, we're just, we're gonna build momentum doing the same thing over and over again. And so the way to get off the hamster wheel of grind culture is to be bold and brave and to reimagine values around work, the things that we've just kind of accepted through. Remember that Google search I showed y'all with professionalism? That's where that's what we think is professional at, at, on a collective level, those photos I showed you. Okay. We spend so much of our time work that is unacceptable. Where is the space for people who don't look like those things that I showed on Google? Where is the space for people who don't want to wear a suit every day? Are we just not professional? Um, then we also have to look at our own biases around what we think what professional is. Because does everybody think that we should wear whatever we want? Or is there like a, well, hold on. 
maybe not on all days, right? Maybe just on Friday, we should wear whatever we want, you know? Um, so like really getting into the points of tension around, okay, well, what is acceptable to me? And then what is not acceptable? And then starting to, to interrogate. So this is some really, really deep internal work, okay? So the four steps, so I'm gonna, um, once again, I wanna reiterate that question. What is in your locus of control? So similarly, so the gratitude question. And if people have anything else they wanna say around what they're grateful for, still put it into the chat. Gratitude, having an attitude of gratitude. I'm actually gonna say I'm grateful for beautiful sunny weather today. Sun is shining gorgeously where, I'm, where I am and I'm very grateful for that. So, um, keeping in when you're able to or when, you, when it's starting to click, what's in your locus of control around decolonizing the workplace so i'm going to share these four tips and then we'll we'll close in conversation so the first way that we can decolonize the workplace is to reimagine professionalism okay professionalism is a colonial construct okay it was created for us to easily like a lot to fit into certain boxes be more productive and to act as similarly to each other as possible because that you know more of the same or having people on the same accord creates more productivity at least that's what we've been told okay so with that being said y'all hit the nail on the head you already are talking about it what's our what's our dress code so when i ask you that question around what's in your locus of control do you have any kind of power around dress code at all? Okay, so move in where your power is, okay? Are you writing any manuals at all? You know, um, are you on any committees where people are reviewing manuals? That's in your locus of control to kind of push back against the narrative of the way things have been taught to us, okay? So not only are dress code policies set to uphold professionalism by centering whiteness, but also patriarchy too. So then there's that question, and we got to say, I am going to name it, um, you know, who gets to dress however they want? That changes sometimes. It changes based upon race. It changes based upon gender. It changes based upon body type. That person can, can wear athleisure to work, but that other person, I don't know. They got to wear something else, right? So really kind of thinking about that. And, you know, when we are in positions of power, because I've definitely been silenced in the workplace several times and several points in my life around what I'm wearing to work and that not being appropriate. And to whoever said that, or Hope who said that, like I am no more productive than if I'm in a suit, than if I'm like in sweatpants, I totally feel that. Um, so, yeah, if you're in charge in any way of setting company culture, or if you have a voice in it, the dress code is definitely a, a, in your locus of control. Considering holidays, and actually, let me just stop for a second to um, All right, awesome. So, okay, looks like we, um, listening well is in my control. That's what Hope says, okay? At home and at work. I feel like a better person when I listen from a place of love. Okay, that's a great point, Hope. Listening well is in your control, okay? And so then my next question to you would be like, how might you create structures in your calendaring practices so that you're able to listen well like listen as deeply as you possibly can right um so that might mean um you know if you're if you have a meeting that's set to go for an hour um you know maybe you calendar out you know in your cat maybe you do a calendaring thing where you actually uh, give yourself an hour and 30 minutes for that you know because hey some people might have other questions and we may have all been in that situation where we've been in a meeting and like um, we're rushing things because we have a next the next meeting to go to. So um, understanding that, yes, listening well is great and creating the structures to listen well, like how can, you know, pushing your locus of control even for great structures around. Okay? Um, 
So the next one is I see creating, I don't, sorry, I don't know what's, okay. Creating a space for feedback regularly, making sure that you're following up with that feedback. Great, we're gonna practice that today, actually. We're gonna practice feedback because it's really difficult. It's really, really difficult to give authentic feedback. Um, and that's because a lot of times we're in a society that feels like where we feel like we're not able to do it um, or we don't have the time to do it because somebody has to create the assessment and aggregate the data and all that sort of stuff. And then we're afraid of pissing people off. Um, and yeah, to so create transparency. Okay, so we're gonna do a really like chill um, feedback activity to um, to support with, with that. Um, so, Yes, Kiko says, turning off notifications is within my control. Time management, boundary setting, yes. And with that, I need to figure out how to turn off my notifications from my phone, because I definitely don't want that on my computer. Um, Hope says, that's a helpful idea. I will take that suggestion and calendar differently. I actually have a calendaring tool that I'm going to give to y'all. We're not going to be able to do it today, but if this is sparking, if this conversation is sparking something in you, there is a there is a level two that you can do to start really calendaring out timing for thriving. Okay. So I will share that with y'all at the end. Um, so that's the first one. The first one is how do, might we reimagine professionalism, right? And give each other grace, um, give each other grace in the process, right? Because we're learning, we're at different points of learning in this journey. Um, and so like, yeah, so finding opportunities to, um, you know, really finding opportunities to create humane settings in our workplaces, which can, is actually a lot harder to do um, than, than we might think. Um, so the second way is to reconsider holidays, okay? Holidays, so we all love holidays. I have never really liked Columbus Day, but I'm gonna be honest, and I don't acknowledge Columbus Day at all, but I'm gonna be honest, if I'm working a job and I get Columbus Day off, I'm gonna take Columbus Day off because it's a day to not be on, okay? I'm gonna take that, you know? And I think a lot of us are at that point where it's like, okay, I might not like agree with this holiday, but like, I'm gonna take that because it's time. It's time for me to go do grocery shopping. It's time to spend some meaningful time with my kids. It's time to catch up on rest, okay? So how might we keep our holidays, but reconsider them? That's my next, that's my next um, offering around decolonizing the workplace. So thinking about what holidays are currently granted at your institution, what do these holidays typically honor? Do they traditionally honor white cisgendered males? If you have any decision making power at your institution, can you make a brave move to consider changing the holidays um, that your institution recognizes? So um, I was doing some some consulting work with a, uh, a, a, a tech startup company, black owned tech startup company. And I had to like really go to bat with Juneteenth, why we should take, you know, like why she might, her company might want to acknowledge Juneteenth, okay? And I say that because, you know, also just coming from her perspective, she is, um, you know, a lot of times black women who are running things have a lot more pressure put on them because they're in a position of power. And it's just because of the way our systems are currently set up. I worked with her to kind of move through the fear of acknowledging Juneteenth because she, you know, was a little bit afraid of like not seeming as professional, you know, not seeming as serious in this like aggressively white tech world that she was in. Okay. Um, and so just knowing that, um, you know, and then I was like, okay, well, we have Starbucks, you know, I think Starbucks recently started to acknowledge Juneteenth. Um, and so like showing her other corporate examples helped, but it's really sad that it's like, um, there's this feeling of not feeling safe enough to do it because you're going to be judged a certain way as a black woman of an, um, owning an organization or owning a company acknowledging Juneteenth than Starbucks doing it. So just kind of really thinking about about the psychology that goes be behind that. Um, 
Malcolm X's birthday, you know, can we acknowledge that if that's a thing or um, May Day, Cesar Chavez Day. Another thing we can do is not everybody's going to agree on the um, holidays that they want to take off or not. Um, is there a way to do a flexible holiday system? So maybe if I knew that there were flexible holidays, I just mentioned that um, I don't acknowledge Christopher Columbus, really. I don't I don't agree with anything he stood for. And yet I just said, if I'm working at an organization and Columbus Day is off, I'm taking it off. But if I had an option of either taking Columbus Day off or maybe taking Malcolm X's birthday off, what I, I could do, I could, you know, in my locus of control, I could move my day off to Malcolm X, you know. So just kind of finding ways like sometimes it's like, well, you only have X amount of holidays written into the, the, the calendar, you know, and just figuring out how can we make it so that it's a little bit more expansive for folks. Okay, um, so that might mean, though, making sure you have demographic data of your employees on record. That's the way that, you know, you kind of have to have that. Um, it's also, you know, another thing to think about is like religious and cultural markers um, that may not currently be recognized in your employee handbook. I'll give you an example. I used to um, uh, work at a English company and um, I, I taught students all over the world. teenage boys class they're about years old they were the youngest also in the class too and um you know they they tended to you know they were they were younger and stuff and so um you know sometimes they were a little bit more rambunctious and i started noticing at some point that you know they started having their heads down there's two two guys in particular started having their heads down on the desk and i'm like okay what's going on like why is your head down like you know what, what's going you know and they were like well it's ramadan and you know really difficult to focus you know because they're in school all day it's really difficult to focus. you know you can't drink water or eat any food um and that was my ignorance right um that i could have you know my locus of control was would have been you know to really understand okay who's in my classroom um also like what maybe even a a survey at the beginning of the class which is like what holidays do you observe it's just not something I thought about. It wasn't even something I knew I, I that was in my locus of control, okay? Um, but the thing about it is a lot of us are writing policies um, and then at the same time, we, um, we're just kind of like writing policies and we're so busy and we're just go, go, go and we're stressed out ourselves that, you know, these things fall off the radar and it's not, I, I think like we need to stop kicking ourselves for that too, like understanding we're all human, like, we are like we're never gonna be this perfect thing all we can do is grow and evolve you know and it's like once we understand like i'm here to progress i'm not here to be perfect i'm here to make progress um i think like once we start reframing these conversations in that way we're going to be able to get a lot further with it okay um another thing is thanksgiving i really really don't like celebrating thanksgiving i've been calling thanksgiving gratitude day for the past couple years you know and that's been helping me reframe but at the same time i'm gonna like take my thanksgiving breaks when i can because that's time to reclaim for myself um but if i had a little bit more opportunity to um to kind of choose when i take that time off vacation and restoration that might help me to um to be a little bit more empowered when i do take time off too because nobody wants to feel guilty for taking a day off you know um everybody deserves it and just because the actual holiday might you know might have some bad uh, or not you know less favorable um origins right um how can we keep our time off but like bring it into a thing supports us with um creating the world it is that we want to see okay um so that's around reconsidering holidays i know that that's a lot of calendaring i get that that's a lot of calendaring that's some more information gathering i understand that that is more work there is more work required like whoever needs to do this you know working in hr and all that stuff it could be an initial headache and yet you know we're in it for the long game you know what how might culture shift over one year if we did that 
you know, just in general, how people feel seen and heard. So that's just something to think about. So I am going to holidays as a non <laughs> Courtney says holidays as a non Christian person is a whole situation. Okay, sending love to Michelle, who had to, to, to leave. Yes. And it's something we don't talk about. It's just like, look, you got a holiday, didn't you? That should be enough. But it's like, no, um, actually, how can we continue to push the boundaries around professionalism? We've already determined that this is a white cisgendered, a lot of times patriarchal dynamic that we're that we're dealing with. And so how what's in our locus of control to push the envelope? Um, so the next thing would be reimagining hierarchies. This is really difficult. This is really, really difficult. I um, want to take a moment to connect with our breath. I'm actually going to hit another round of the singing bowls. We're going to take one mindful moment. So for this next minute, check in with your body, check in with your breath, check in with any points of tension that you might be feeling. If you do feel a point of tension during this one minute, cool down. Um, breathe into that point of tension. So for example, if you start understanding that like, oh, my shoulders are a little bit, are a little bit tense, or my neck feels stiff, really focus your energy when you breathe into those areas, okay? take this moment to think about one thing that you're grateful for and start to feel that moment of gratitude expanding throughout your being. Maybe it starts in your heart, but it spreads slowly down to your feet. Maybe it starts in your feet, but spreads fully up to your, the top of your head. I acknowledge that these are difficult conversations. That's why we don't have them a lot of times. I acknowledge this is hard work. A lot of times this means really uh, taking a brave look at ourselves. We work to support with imagining systems, taking a moment to observe the ways we may have perpetuated some of these systems. And we may have done it just because we felt like, well, we had to, you know, we have to, um, we have to keep being up, upwardly mobile. We have to, you know, we're in a system. So just understanding that, like, that is all very human and we're all in the same boat together. We've all had to do certain things with the system. And, um, you know, maybe it wasn't an, of our highest ideal deals or our highest values and that's okay. And also understand and you know being brave and understanding like I have power and i'm going to find and access that power and i'm going to use it okay. And so, with that note. Uh, moving on to imagining hierarchies. Okay, so going back to that story I shared where I was like trying to collect data and like. Nobody wanted to like give any like feedback on paper about that were going on with like leadership organization. Um, that's when I really started to like, I had to do a lot of work around, okay, well, what else is out there outside of hierarchical leadership? And if you think about hierarchies, like the first thing I can is like a pyramid, right? So you got like the pyramid, the base of the pyramid really is really, uh, you know, it stretches out wide, progresses, right? It gets smaller at the top, right? And there's not a lot of room at the top. Uh, we say that a lot, you know, we say we about leadership, it's lonely at top. But 
decisions on behalf of people. A lot that goes into it, okay? One way to reimagine hierarchies is to change that pyramid that you have in your mind and to just flatten it out a bit, all right? What if that, um, you know, how might the shape of the pyramid shift um, if we stretched it out a bit so that there was more room at the top, okay? So it, it is does require literally restructuring. So even think of with a building, if your organization or your institution were a building, and if you are in a hierarchical institution now, you might be existing in a pyramid shape, shaped building, right? What does, what might it look like to uh, reimagine that building? And as I'm talking, if, if that's something you want to do and start kind of doodling, what does that even look like, right? I love doodling. I learn a lot when I just do freehand doodles in meetings um, because it's a way, it's actually a way for your subconscious mind to process those things. So that might be something if you're fidgeting a bit or something, literally, if you have a pen and a paper near you, what does flattening out a hierarchy look like just with a doodle, you know, um, it's that's our subconscious mind speaks mainly through emotions and images. And so it may seem like a harmless doodle that nobody's going to see, but it's actually working to rewire your brain when you do that kind of stuff. Um, so let's go back to hierarchies. All right, let's go back to the fact that um, the ways in which uh, the system of grind culture is, is currently perpetuated has a lot to do with um, only a couple people being able to be at the top and these couple people need to manage a large mass of people and they need to do it with as little bit of money as possible, the most cost effective, the most time effective way as possible and the harm that that could cause, not just to the people they're managing, but to the managers themselves very harmful. There's a lot of stress involved in that. And so my offering, if you are a manager or an employer, if you do anything to onboard people at all, um, how might you use the utilize the collective resources and wisdom of your team? So I'm on part three, reimagine hierarchies. And I'm on, um, I'm on paragraph two, when it comes to that. So um, what systems of checks and balances are you incorporating to check your power and privilege in the workplace to ensure that you're not subconsciously perpetuating systems of domination and control in your leadership style? I'm going to put it back to me and I'm going to talk about some of the ways I, I definitely fell on my face with reimagining hierarchies. While I was trying to do all this systemic work around like, well, how can how can we make it so that people feel more safe in the uh, in the workplace, there were times where I was not taking enough of a critical look at the ways I was exercising like my own power and privilege just by the fact that I was, you know, people's manager and supervisor, there's a certain way that I needed to to in interact and engage and it was because I wasn't doing enough of my shadow work. Um, as it's called, where we just really look at the parts of ourselves that we don't really like to look at, but like taking those important moments to analyze, um, not just what we do, um, but like what we are, like what's going on in our subconscious. And so I understand that requires more time. I understand that requires more responsibility, but it's so necessary. The more power you have in these systems, the more time you need for self-evaluation. It's, it's critical. It's critical for your own mental well-being and for the mental well-being of, of the folks that, um, that you are managing, okay? Um, so finding out, creating those systems of checks and balances, maybe that's your journaling to yourself once a week, right? Um, and we're going to do this activity in a little bit, which is um, how, how did I glow and how can I grow? That's a really easy, it's a really easy assessment very non-threatening, glow and grow, right? So it takes, off, it takes out a lot of the judgment of like needing to be perfect, needing to have all of the boxes checked. Um, how did I glow this week when it comes to inner, you know, inner, my interpersonal interactions at work? How can I grow, right? So it's not like, oh, you missed this. Well, you didn't do that, but it's like, okay, 
here are some of the ways I showed up um, that was kind of kick ass. And here are some of the ways where it's like, okay, I might need to go back to the drawing board with that. Okay. So that's an easy one. You know, if you're managing a lot of people, like making sure that you're constantly, um, not just how did you glow and how can you grow in like your productivity? That's easy. That's really easy. Moving beyond that, like the interpersonal dynamics that you're having in your organization, that sort of thing. Um, being able to hold that mirror up to yourself. Some other questions you can ask for yourself as you reimagine hierarchies is how can I collaborate and seek justice, liberation, and restoration for employees? Um, thinking about ancestral wisdom, you know, moving beyond just the individual. How can the ancestral wisdom of people on our team guide us as we fulfill our roles within this organization? So honoring people, not just like for what they do in the organization, but like all of the lineages that they come into the organization with, because we don't have to name it. It's still there. It's still playing itself out, whether or not we name it or not. Um, and so even like bringing ancestral wisdom into the space of um, of professional workplaces um, is, is another way too. And uh, the last way, uh, number four, for things that you might be able to do to decolonize your workplace, depending upon what your locus of control is, is to create feedback loops. But the way in which you do it um, has, you know, is, is important, um, I will say. So how are we soft, uh, fostering safe and brave spaces in the workplace? So we, as we need points of feedback. And so how can we create opportunities that are consistent for honesty and transparency without it feeling like, you know, we're going to be judged or we need to judge people or we need to be cruel to people. Cause a lot of people, like a lot of us, we, we want to get along, you know, we don't want to rock the boat too much. We don't, we, we want to be liked and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes feedback can feel like a dirty word in that sense. Right. Cause anything less than those five stars, um, could be problematic, okay? So some things that you could um, think about is like how often are you getting feedback from your team on the managerial practices that are working and the ones that are not? Do your employees within your organization feel safe speaking up? Will they even answer your assessment? Um, so one way to decolonize the workplace is low stakes feedback. A lot of times I'll go into organizations and I'll look at their assessment and it's like so long and so daunting and it just took me 20 minutes to complete and I had to take all these steps to do it and it just feels scary. It feels so scary. So how can we like lower the stakes on feedback? Does it have to be a fully scaled out evaluation? I know we need the numbers to report back. And a lot of times like we're isolating honest communication with those evaluation systems too. How can we make sure that feedback is anonymous and accessible? Um, how can we ensure that feedback is not just hierarchical? Um, so the manager providing feedback to the managed, we get that a lot, right? Like, oh, your employee reviews coming up. This is how you glowed. This is where you need to grow. Is there a way to do more self-assessment? Um, when are employees able or pe team members able to assess themselves? A lot of, we can assess ourselves way better than anybody else can assess us. We already know, we already know, intuitively we know. So like providing those moments of opportunity um, can be supportive, okay? And um, yeah, I think that I'm gonna stop there, I gave, four tools that had multi-layered, like that were very multi-layered. I'm gonna take a risk and go on camera. If like, if my sound blows up, let me know. All right, I'm gonna take a risk, okay. Can you hear me? Okay, <laughs> cool. Um, so we're gonna practice, we're gonna practice feedback. I'm gonna give you two points of practice for feedback, low stakes, low stakes. I almost made this like, the impersonal evaluation piece, but I'm, I kind of want to take it a deeper level with this group. Um, so we're going to do two levels of feedback. Um, let me actually, before we do that, I'm going to scroll down, see if there's anything I missed. Okay, okay. So 
audio was kind of breaking up. Interesting. Okay. You know, uh, I don't know. I, I heard it's Mercury retrograde. I'm not sure. Like, I'm in downtown San Francisco. We're supposed to have the best, like, Wi-Fi here. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what to... <laughs> I don't know. Um, but with that being said, um, two things. Number one, let's, let's do low stakes. So we're going to focus on glow and grow. And we're going to first do a self-assessment, okay? So my self-assessment, um, so how, how did you glow during this conversation on this call? How did you glow and how can you grow? So if you want to think of yourself as a participant on an, in an online call, just like really, you know, I had, you know, there was somebody who was like, oh, I should have been off. I shouldn't have been off camera or, you know, this or that, whatever, whatever that looks like for you. How did you glow in this conversation? And how might you be able to grow? Okay. This is, this is for you. You're not going to have to share this with anybody. Okay. So if you could take the next um, couple minutes to, um, to really focus on like your glows and grows, that's going to be level one self-assessment. Okay. And then level two is going to be for me as a presenter, how did I glow and where can I grow? Okay. Because if you can't do it here in a workshop for decolonizing the workplace, and you're a lot of y'all may not see me again, okay? If you can't do it here, how are you gonna do it? You know, and you're like the people you see every day, you know. So this practice is really important. I only say this because I was in a situation where nobody like wanted to speak, you know. So let's just practice, right? Like low stakes. I'm low stakes right here, okay? I have no power over your anything. Okay. <laughs> so number one, how did you glow as a participant on this call? How might you grow? Okay. In future online engagements, you should try to grow at some point. You know, if you say, I don't need to grow, I'm going to be like, really? We're all living beings. We're growing all the time, you know? Um, there's no high bar though. You're not gonna, you're never gonna get to a hundred percent. That's not about it. So think of yourself evolving, not as like reaching the top, okay? And then you're gonna give me that same feedback. So you're gonna do this, you know, the first part. Is, second part, if you, now you don't have to give me the feedback in the chat. Cause I know for some people it's like, okay, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna tell her. I'm not gonna tell her. Um, but you could even, you could send it to me. Um, you could do a private message too, if you want, if you could do that too, if you're like, I don't want to be like exposed. So you could do that too. Okay. Um, and you'll feel a lot better when you do it. I think there's like the anxiety at the beginning is a lot, um, more than the actual doing the thing. Okay. Um, yes, I will share the word cloud. Yes. Let me get to that. So let's just take a moment um glows and grows start with yourself always start with you got to start with you um and then and then you 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 move out to the uh, to the other things you know um and so i'll model you know i'll say for me on this call um how can i or how did i glow i liked being able to like move away from the powerpoint sometimes like um feel like I'm presenting a lot of frameworks and stuff, but it, it prevents a deeper connection with the people that I'm um, communicating with, especially like when it's online. Um, a way that I can grow is I think I am now at a point where I definitely need a dual screen. Okay, I've been trying to avoid dual screen for a really long time. <laughs> I'm at a point where I need a dual screen. So that's how I can grow is like setting up my dual screen. So I can see everything that's going on. Okay. Thank you, Ash. Awesome. And then I will get that word cloud as well as we consider the ways that we can glow and how we might be able to, um, the ways that we glow and how we might be able to, to grow as well.
Okay, I'm going to share that cloud with y'all. Presentation sharing. Oh, okay. Here are the live results. Awesome. All right. Bye, Karen. I hope you have a good rest of your day. Okay. Glows and grows. All right. So um, any, any brave people or not brave, you're, you're bra everybody's brave, brave in this instance, um, would like to share a personal glow and grow. So some way that they might that they glowed in the participation of this chat and then how they might grow in the future. Let's see what this new message said. Okay, Ash, all right, self. I glowed by being on top of the chat and being technically supportive. I could grow by being more prepared with how I want to feel in the space physically during the call. Yes, so maybe like taking like five more minutes before, right? To just get a little bit more ground. Is that what you mean? More like timing and stuff? Like giving yourself time and space? Okay. All right, let's see. Michelle, I glowed by being responsive and paying attention to the chat. I need to work on not multitasking so much during these, working on it. Oh, I have a weird thing about multitasking. I have a lot of air energy, so I need, I have to do something with my hands all the time. I just mentioned how I doodle a lot and, and sometimes that helps me. So it depends, it just depends. If it makes me, you might, it might, might be okay for you to multitask, but maybe like the sorts of multitasking you're doing could, you know, I just wanted to offer another perspective of like multitasking isn't always, doesn't mean that you're not getting stuff out of it. Um, all right, anyone else? I'll jump in. Okay. I actually had wrote, written Michelle that I was glowing by being present and not multitasking. So I appreciate that comment, but the thanks for the reframe as well. My grow was, um, I had put some comments in, but didn't hit send. As I was oh, okay. <laughs> thinking. So leaning, I do a lot of processing, trying to take everything in, being a little bit more quick. Do you have your comments still? Do you want to share them now or, or is it, is the time just passed already? <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's germane. I, there was a piece around what does deco decolonizing look like? And it was around just not checking parts of yourself at the door and having to conform to unspoken rules and asking questions around what those are and, and deciphering an organization. Mm -hmm. um, many of us know that we're always code switching. So there's a piece of trying to understand what's happening, but never fully actually understanding the rules that we're playing by. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was awesome. the Thank you so much for sharing. All right, what about, oh, I see Ash says need to set up my standing desk. I know the setting up of all the equipment, you get the equipment, but then you gotta set it up. And yes, I feel you. Chris Lynn says, I glowed by doing lots of self-reflection on the questions slash topics presented and thinking about how I can apply this in my day-to-day -day grow. I could have participated more in the chat slash verbally, need to watch the multitasking as well. And another offering that I would share too, um, Chris Lynn, is your presence is a present. Sometimes we think we like, have to always contribute to the conversation and yet you might be like processing through some really deep topic like you know some people are more processors like you literally you take a while to like process and you're like you know a day later you're like oh yeah now i you know so just like understanding like we're not all on autopilot you know we're not siri we don't have it you know so that's okay too um all right and then kiko says i glowed answering prompts and paying attention I may be growing by thinking deeper, wider on topics. I love how you said that. I may be growing like you're you you're also like understanding that there is a process happening, right? This is about process over product, okay? And also understanding growth is an instantaneous. It's a very very long thing. You'll sow a seed and not see it for grow for several months, right? All right. All right. 
Shinhei. Um, I glowed by turning on video, participating in chat and centimeter and taking notes. My grow is continuous unlearning of what I have been taught in the Caribbean around professionalism and leadership. Ashe, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, understanding too that a lot of what we carry with us around what's professional has been, we're regurgitating. Maybe it started in childhood, right? Maybe it started in our ancestry and we were carrying that, that DNA with us and perpetuating. And so um, like, this is not, I think once we understand like this is a process of deconditioning, it takes some of the pressure off of us from having to have it all right. We're not, this is messy, very, very messy. Thank you. Okay. Um, it's five minutes. We have five minutes before I'm set to, to end this. So I'm gonna take my own advice that I shared at the beginning. So one way we decolonize, right? The first five minutes of a meeting, chill out. You know, we don't get straight into the content immediately. You know, give it like five minutes. Okay, you need water, you need tea. I'm gonna make the same offering. I don't know what y'all are doing in five minutes. Some of y'all might be on a literal call in five minutes. If so, please try not to do that anymore. Like if there's one thing, like try to, to add padding. I am gonna share a link for um, a thriving toolkit. It will take some time, I'm not gonna lie, like done. Um, it does look at your calendar and start actually calendaring out time about now i'm going to send this to ash too uh, if you ash if you want to share this to whoever's on the list that you just literally start for the things that give me joy they don't cost a lot of money or any money preferably things because you know it's not real until it's in your during these two to do what we need to do okay so this is going into the chat now you need if you need it um i'll also send this if else you get it and take your it's been so great connecting with y'all hope you have a great rest of your day and week and uh yeah just remember it's okay to it's okay to rest pause all right thank you thank you all right bye thanks so much heather have a good rest of your day you too